Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Bo, Come. The central feature of our Parsha are the final three of the ten plagues. In between the ninth plague, darkness, and the tenth plague, the slaying of the firstborn, we finally begin to sense the great turnabout. We read, Hashem granted the people favor in the eyes of Egypt. The man Moshe was very great in the land of Egypt, in the eyes of the servants of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of the people. And of course, when the moment finally arrives, when there was not a house, where there was no corpse, Pharaoh called to Moshe and Aaron in the night and said, Rise up, go out from among my people. Even you, even the children of Israel, go and serve Hashem as you have spoken. Take even your sheep and even your cattle as you have spoken, and go, and bless me as well. Egypt imposed itself strongly upon the people to hasten to send them out of the land, for they said, We are all dying. Of course, as we shall learn in next week's Torah portion of B'Shalach, this benevolent attitude doesn't last long. But that's another story. Towards the end of our Parsha, the journey of the Exodus itself begins, and we read, The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, the men besides the young children. Also a great mixed multitude went up with them, with flocks and cattle, very much livestock. They baked the dough that they had taken out of Egypt as unleavened cakes, for it had not leavened, for they were driven out of Egypt, and they could not tarry, and also they had not made provisions for themselves. And the, and the habitation of the children of Israel that they dwelled in Egypt was 430 years. It came to pass, at the end of 430 years, it came to pass in that very day that all the legions of Hashem went out of the land of Egypt. It is a night of anticipation for Hashem to take them out of the land of Egypt. This night is Hashem's, guarding all the children of Israel throughout their generations. The other major focus in our Parshat Bo is the Pesach observance, the Passover offering. The commandment is given to the entire assembly for each household to take a lamb or kid on the 10th of this month, Nisan, and to slaughter it on the afternoon of the 14th day of the month, immediately prior to the Exodus itself. And all the details of the seven-day Passover festival, the eternal commemoration of the Exodus, are given here. Chapter 12, in which these details of Pesach are given, begins with a unique commandment. Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be for you the first of the months of the year. This commandment, the concept of Rosh Chodesh, the sanctification of the new moon at the beginning of a new month, is the very first commandment that God gave to the children of Israel collectively, as a nation, and He did this while they were still in the darkness of Egypt. The significance of the interjection of the concept of Rosh Chodesh, the sanctification of the month, at this particular point in the Parsha, needs to be understood. Now presumably, the reason for its appearance at this point is clearly connected to the Passover offering, since the flip side, or rather the companion aspect, of this mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh in general is the particular detail, the commandment for the month of Nisan, known as the month of redemption, that the month of Nisan should be the first of the months. That is, the biblical calendar begins with the month of Nisan. Thus the Torah continues, On the tenth of this month they shall take for themselves each man a lamb or a kid, etc. But as we've learned, this concept of Rosh Chodesh is so deep, because really, it's the beginning of the recording of time. And if there was no recording of time before this, this is like the creation of time itself. And Israel is responsible for it, for keeping time. Since Hashem is above time, time is a tool for man's conception. The moment of this verse, it's the beginning of Israel's marking of time. And through this mitzvah, Hashem thus commands Israel to administrate to be the masters of time, as opposed to consenting that time should be our master. So open up your hearts in deepest way. This is mind-bending. We are commanded here to be in charge of time. And all this was said while yet in the heart of darkness, the slavery-dominated land of Egypt. Specifically, Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, what is the verse adding? This is the first commandment given to Israel in the Torah, and it had to be given in Egypt. 
So why was this first national commandment given in the land of Egypt? This mitzvah of sanctifying time is so full of possibility, so full of human potential. How will we spend our time? The very expression, spend time, is chilling. Time is a commodity, like money, that we use up. Are we spending it wisely or are we squandering it? Rosh Chodesh, the new month, represents a privilege as well as an imperative. And it was given over to Israel while yet in Egypt because everything Torah teaches us about time and its potential and everything that, that the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh means for the Jewish people is the diametric opposite of what Egypt was all about. Egypt, Mitzrayim, means the narrow place. The idolatry of Egypt, the slave mentality, it's all staleness, it's one-dimensional, illusory. <clears throat> illusory, excuse me. It's a mental prison. It's a gravitational pull into oblivion. That is what we were up against and why we had to get out so badly and so quickly and in every exile situation, national, individual, physical or spiritual, then as well as now, that gravitational pull into despair is the danger. Rosh Chodesh is a guarantee from God that everything can begin again, that we can become brand new, be reborn, start fresh. This is the secret of the constant exodus from Egypt which needs to happen every day. One reason why it's a commandment for us to remember and mention the going out of Egypt every single day of our lives. Not just because it was such a shake-up and demonstrated Hashem's total orchestration of the universe, that's true, but also because we still need to be focused on, our, on, on leaving our own personal exile constantly, on renewing ourselves each day. We need to remember that just as Hashem did it for us then, He does it for us now. Just as Hashem renews all of creation every day, as we mention in our morning prayers. And all this is the opposite of Egypt and everything it represents, where we were slaves to time, or rather, the lack of time. And there was no time. It was the same old, same old. Even the new king who arose in Parsha Shemot, according to one opinion to recall, was the same old king. He just pretended to be new, because it could be no newness in Egypt. When Hashem's light is hidden in exile, as Pharaoh endeavored to keep it hidden in Egypt. And as it can be for us today as well, it's the same old, same old. There can't be anything new because without the endless possibilities that our belief in and our connection to Hashem places before us, there's no chance of change. There's no way of fighting the gravitational pull into despair. That's exactly what Pharaoh and his ilk were and are counting on today. Today there's a lot of talk about mind control slavery, but Pharaoh was the originator of that as well. And in a world without God, a world whose creation by God is denied, there can never be any change. Pharaoh's world and the world of the Pharaohs of today is a world of narcissism, arrogance, and control, exploitation and manipulation. Pharaoh says, who needs Hashem? I don't even know him. I'm throwing a party and he's not invited. Look at Hashem's chilling words, his prophecy to Ezekiel for Pharaoh and for his modern-day lookalikes in Ezekiel chapter 29. In the tenth year, the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, the word of Hashem came to me saying, Son of man, direct your face towards Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy concerning him and concerning all of Egypt. Speak and say, Thus says Hashem Elohim, Behold, I am against you. I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great serpent that crouches within its rivers, who has said, the river is mine and I have made it myself. God says, yes, to you is the power and the glory. You made the Nile. But in the verse where we read, behold, I am against you, the Hebrew is actually, hirni alecha. Doesn't mean I am against you, it means I am onto you. God says to Pharaoh, I'm onto you. In the time of exile, the truth is most concealed, most hidden, by the ones who deny that Hashem's word is the rule. They say they have created everything themselves. It sounds familiar. That's why our sages teach us that every Shabbat, whoever sanctifies the day at the entrance to Shabbat, whoever makes kiddush over a cup of wine, thus testifying that Hashem created the world, such a person becomes a full partner in creation. 
because one who makes Kiddush is the opposite of Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh denied that Hashem created the world. This is why Shabbat is called a remembrance of the exodus from Egypt. And on Shabbat, when all things return to their root, to their pristine state, it's revealed that all the world's life force is from Hashem. Exile is about being stuck, being stuck in the narrow places, about giving up on change. Rosh Chodesh, the words actually mean Rosh Chadash, a new head. It beckons us to get a new head, a new mind, a new mindset. And we can get one every month, just like the moon, which is reborn. As the very foundations of Egyptian leadership, culture, and society, all the foundations that were based on self-centeredness and denial and illusion and manipulation, as all these foundations came crashing down all around the people of Israel, while yet in Egypt, as the people of Israel approached the time for the de their departure from this horrible place, which was the crucible of their formation as a nation, they're commanded to sanctify time as their vehicle that will ensure and nurture true and lasting freedom, indeed the only real freedom, constant renewal, and the call to rise above mental slavery of despair, the ability to begin again.